and we are recording. Okay, so an official welcome to everyone to Amazing Amphibians. Uh, let's get started. So we've had uh, some time to watch a quick little video about the, the general work of uh, the Division of Fish and Wildlife, and we're going to kind of talk about how uh, our, our work on amphibians fits into that, um, that bigger mission. Um, but uh, before we really get into amphibians, we just want to highlight a couple of things um, related to uh, the work that we do at, at the Division of Fish and Wildlife. So first and foremost, um, you know, Gabby and I were in that video, we're at the Great Swamp Management Area, uh, and which is located down here uh, in Southeast Um And we have management areas all across the states. So all of these green blobs here uh, are management areas that are protected by uh, the Division of Fish and Wildlife and also um, jointly managed by the Division of Forest Environment. Uh, and these are places that are open to the public. We invite you to come check them out and uh, take a hike, walk your dog. Um, but they are primarily for wildlife habitat uh, conservation and management, but also for hunting and fishing opportunity. Uh, so this is a you know a great way that that folks can get out and access the outdoors, um, whether that's through hunting, fishing, hiking, biking, horseback riding, uh, bird watching. There's, these are multi-use areas, um, but it's always important to remember that um, hunting is allowed. And Gabby will talk about. Um, uh, so, some rules and regulations uh, required um, by, by all of our users uh, if you're going out in the management areas. Uh, but these are just really great places um, that you can go visit. And Lindsay's going to put a link in the chat. Uh, there's an interactive map that you can check out if you've uh, never been to a management area before, you want to know which one is closest to your home. Uh, there's a really great little map that we have on the DEM website uh, that you can click around and uh, interact with that map. And it shows you where the parking areas are and trailheads, et cetera, uh, boat uh, launches, fishing areas. Um, so it's a really great resource. Um, I use it <laughs> all the time, you know, when I go visit state land because I, I still get lost <laughs> in some places. So I highly recommend you check it out. Uh, it's a great resource for you there. I'll hand it over to Gabby to talk a little bit about Orange. So if you do want to come visit one of our management areas, the only thing that we ask is that you remember to wear your orange during the hunting season. So we have this nice little graphic here so that you can see the green is when you don't need to wear it and the orange is when you do. So you need to wear it um, all the way from the beginning of, of September all the way until the end of May. There is like a gap right now where you don't really need to wear orange, but I always just wear it anyway. Um, turkey season, the spring turkey season starts in the end of April and it goes through the end of May. So just to be safe, I just wear orange all the way through that time and then you know you don't have in the summer. So after, um, at the end of May, you don't have to wear anymore all the way until beginning of September, then you need to start again. Um, so it's the only thing we ask. They're really beautiful. So we definitely encourage you to go and check them out. Um, the best time for, for looking at amphibians is coming up right now. So if you want to go out, uh, explore some of our management areas and listen for some of the sounds we're going to play for you today, then now is a Oh, Gabby, you just muted for a second. There you are, you're back. All righty, so let's jump into amphibians. So if you've been to any of our programs, <laughs> you know that Gabby and I love trivia. Uh, so we love to teach through trivia. So we encourage you uh, as we go through some of these trivia questions, type your answers in the chat, take a guess um, and participate because uh, we want to make this as interactive as possible. We know we can't be in person, so we try to make it uh, lots of fun for everybody. And of course we have, you know, we're going to talk about the species of amphibians that live here in Rhode Island. Uh, this is a very rare species, Hermit Froggy Eye. Uh, you can sometimes see him in Rhode Island swamps uh, playing the banjo. So let's get started. So our first trivia question is give an example of an amphibian. So we're talking about general groups of animals, you know, general groups. What, what will we call an amphibian? Let's check our chat and see. I'm seeing frogs, salamanders, newts, toads. Great. Any other guesses? All right. Let's see, you guys hit the hit it right on the nose. So we have frogs, we have toads, newts, salamanders, and there's also a really weird uh, little group of amphibians called Sicilians. Um, my dad always jokes when I was learning about these in college, I was like, did you ever hear of a Sicilian? And he was like, yeah, they're from Italy. Uh, so <laughs> they are not from Italy. Uh, you can find these in uh, tropical areas, uh, tropical rainforests in South America, Southeast Asia, uh, and Central Africa. So it looks nothing like a frog or a toad or a salamander. Um, it looks kind of like a worm, uh, but it is an amphibian. Uh, so does anybody know, like, so why, why would this 
be an amphibian? Why are all of these guys kind of related? What are some characteristics of amphibians that make them amphibians? Some adaptations, maybe. So we're saying no scales. Their eggs are laid in water. They need water to breathe. Absolutely. They're cold blooded. Yes. Any other guesses? Other adaptations? Gills to lungs, right? They move to land. Absolutely. And these are all great. So you guys know a lot about amphibians. So that's absolutely correct. So they have kind of cold, slimy skin. They are cold blooded. So they, that means that they have to um, take their their temperature from the environment. Uh, so if you ever see like a turtle basking or a snake basking, you know, they're absorbing that heat so that they can that they can um, warm themselves. It's the same thing with amphibians. Um, so they do not create their own body heat as we do. Uh, their skin is uh, slimy and soft, not scaly like a turtle or a snake. Uh, so those are reptiles, right? And the, the amphibians, their skin is very slimy because they have this um, permeable skin. So that means that their skin can take up oxygen, it can take up uh, liquids, it can take up chemicals. Uh, so that makes them very susceptible to pollution uh, because they literally breathe through their skin uh, as well as through, um, through their lungs, but, um, but they're breathing through their skin. So that skin, that's why they always feel cold and kind of slimy. Uh, that slime layer helps to keep them um, nice and, and moist. Uh, so when they're in an environment, if you're ever going to pick up a toad or a frog or a salamander, it's always important to make sure your hands are damp. Uh, if you can dunk them in water or like put some dirt on them or hold the, the animal on top of a leaf on top of your hand, uh, it's always the best way to hold them uh, and handle them. And of course, put them back exactly where you found them. Uh, we don't want to take any, any, any uh, little slimy friends home or relocate them to other areas that can be very, uh, very harmful to them. But um, that by, by uh, wetting your hands, that stops any oils from your hands lotion, hand sanitizer, anything like that uh, can directly transfer to um, those animals and, and be pretty unhealthy for them. Um, so, and we also, somebody had said to partial land and water, right? So they lay their eggs in water and then uh, some of them do. So some of our salamanders kind of lay them in like logs, uh, underneath rotting logs. But for the most part, they're uh, laying their eggs in water. They have gills. When you think of a tadpole, right? That little tadpole has gills first, uh, or the baby salamanders have little gills that stick out. Um, they're un under the water, they're swimming around, and all of a sudden they go through metamorphosis. So they change, their tail absorbs, their legs grow, and then all of a sudden they're up on land. Um, so they're very interesting animals in that they require uh, totally different types of habitats to survive. Awesome, I'm gonna, let's see, go on. I know a lot about amphibians, awesome. So I'll hand it over to Gabby. All right, so our next trivia question, how many frog and toad species are in Rhode Island. And if you want, you can throw any specific species names in there too. So how many frogs and toads and do you know any of their names? Hundreds? Oh, spade foot toad. Someone has been tuning into our programs, I think. <laughs> Wood frog, yeah. We've got some high numbers, we've got some low numbers, gray tree frog. All right, let's reveal the answer. So as far as frogs go, we have seven different species of frogs in Rhode Island. And they kind of start calling throughout the season. So you're not gonna hear them all start calling right now or even in the next few months, but some of them even call, start calling into July. So these are kind of our early callers, the first ones that you're going to hear. So things like the wood frog and the keeper. Um, and we'll have some sound effects that we can play for you, but I just wanted to point these out first. So some, sometimes people get these two confused, the leopard frog and the pickerel frog. So they look really, really, really similar. Um, but the pickerel frog is much more common. So if you see a spotted frog, it's probably a pickerel frog. But if you're in kind of like a salt marsh area, then there is a chance that you could be seeing a leopard frog. And they have kind of more round dots on them. So on their back, you can see they've got more kind of like circles. Whereas the pickerel frog, they have more kind of like squares, like long uh, squares on their back. So these two, just a little bit different, look really similar, but they do sound different. So that's one of the best ways that you can uh, monitor frogs is by just listening to their calls. So they usually call um, at night. Um, so I don't know if any of you, has anyone heard any of these 
frogs calling? Has anyone heard a peeper yet? I know Lindsay said that she had. Oh, someone said tonight you're expecting to, to hear them or that you've heard them already tonight. Awesome. I'm so excited. It's like my favorite time of year. I'm getting so excited. Awesome. So Mary, if you want to start playing some of the sounds, I think we have we have the leopard frog coming up first. Uh, yep, I think I think we can just hop around. So let's see. I'm gonna advance our slide here. So if it's a little loud, I will turn down <laughs> the volume. We'll make sure that this works. the leopard frog it sounds like it's purring a little bit like that's how I remember it's the leopard frog what it, I was gonna say what it, for these other ones we can say what do you think it sounds like because sometimes people come up with these like oh it sounds just like this like that like I think the leopard frog I was thinking it sounds like a door that's like creaking open in like a scary movie <laughs> 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 it's like yeah creaking you gotta open come up with weird ways oh, to remember oh, stuff oh. like <laughs> how, how I remember everything let's play our next um, all right, so I think we could hop, maybe we can compare it to the pickerel frog if we can play that one next. So you can oh, hear they sound kind of similar. Peepers, oh, actually. Peepers. I can oh. play the pickerel frog this way. Anyway, here we go. Any guesses on what that one sounds like? Pickerel frog sounds like a lower pitched dolphin. Ah, yeah, it does kind of. A zipper. Yeah, I always think of zipper, zipper yeah. too. A snore. A snore. I was just going to say somebody snoring like, <laughs> in like a rocking chair. <laughs> Stretching rubber. Stretching yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I almost think. Really random, but I think it sounds like you know, like the thin combs. If you were to run your finger along the comb, oh like, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah. So. All right, so I think everyone has probably heard a spring peeper, but we'll play it anyway, just just because it's beautiful. <laughs> They're actually tree frogs, so they've got sticky toe pads. They can actually climb trees, and they are teeny, teeny, tiny, and they're impossible to find. You can be like, there is a peeper right in front of me, and then you will not be able to find it. You'll hear it, and you'll be, I know it's like on that leaf, but they're so small, and they're so well camouflaged that they're like impossible to find. But if you do see one, the way that you can tell the difference between, say, a wood frog and a spring peeper is that spring peepers, um, they have a little cross on their back and that's where they get their scientific name. So it would be Chris Crucifer, like a cross. So they've got a little X on their back and they've got those sticky toe pads. Whereas the wood frogs, they don't have those sticky toe pads. They can't climb a tree like a, a spring peeper can. The few and times I've got seen- The wood frogs, this one- there we go. The few times I've seen a spring peeper, it was because one ahead. fell out of a tree and bounced off of me. <laughs> like, ah, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> it's a little, a little spring paper. The wood frog. One of my and then of course have wood frog. Yep. <laughs> Type into the chat. Whatever. What What do you think that one sounds like? Wood frog. There was a question in the chat too about the size of spring peepers. Yeah, I see. Okay, so I'll get to the question in one second. So it sounds like it looks like people said quacking ducks, a crow laughing. Yeah, so that's what I always think. I always think ducks. I'm like, oh, there's a bunch of ducks in the woods. <laughs> really, it's the wood frogs. Um, so someone said, how big is a spring peeper? Um, so I would 
if you want to do like a pinky joint, like the tip end of your pinky, they're really small. And then when they're freshly metamorphosed, so they're like just getting out of the water, they're even smaller. They're like teeny, teeny, tiny, like smaller than your pinky fingernail. <laughs> a cat burning itself of a hairball. That's a fun one. I haven't heard of that one before. <laughs> I know. So someone said, I can't believe we're taught that frogs sound like ribbit because there's not really a frog that, that says ribbit. There's some that say different well, would say say different things like well on the next slide we have um i think the bullfrog on there but it, there's not really like a ribbit um all right so our next three that we can talk about someone had said this before so we have a gray tree frog so they're just like the peepers they've got those sticky toe pads so they can climb up trees they're also really really well camouflaged and they can actually their color actually changes uh, based on the temperatures they can be lighter they can be darker I've even seen ones that are really bright green here in Rhode Island, which are beautiful. Um, so these ones can vary a lot, but they've got that kind of mottled bark look to them. Um, and these ones are pretty big. They're not small like the peepers. They can be, let's say, like this big. Um, and again, when they're obviously freshly uh, metamorphosed and they're going to be smaller. Uh, these guys, if you have any of those um, PVC tubes or like drainage pipes they like to go in there and you can actually put those in your yard and they'll they'll go in there if you have a wetland nearby and they might just kind of hunker down there they like it. it's nice and moist um, so you can play that call these ones will start to call a little bit later these these guys are super great though I've seen people post pictures of them in birdhouses um, common in your swimming pool mm -hmm. okay a lot of people have them in their swimming pools in the summer um, I've had them like hop on me. I saved some from the road on a rainy night and instead of hopping across the road, it popped onto my arm and I like, carried it across. There was one that was, Gabby's talking about the tubes too. When I was a seasonal at the um, at one of the Carolina gates, I had to go check something a few weeks in a row. And every week I would go and there was this little tree frog hiding in the, the gate, like the, the cone of the gate. And he was there every single week. <laughs> I'd move him so that he wouldn't get squished by the gate. Every, every week he was hiding in there. Funny. Very charismatic. All right, who, who has a guess what this one sounds like? Who thinks they know what this sounds like? That's like the sound of early summer. It's so nice. Wait, someone said, oh, Mary, you're very quiet. I, I'm not sure if anyone else is having that problem, but you're, you're very quiet. Oh, oh no. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Um, yeah, you're, just, you're a little quiet. I'm not sure if it's just me. Um, so we see a peacock <laughs> fighting the birds. And they're wonderful in late May. Yeah, so they come out a little bit later. Yeah, I can barely hear Mary. Yeah, so I think maybe if you just talk a little louder, maybe it'll help. She's just a little quiet. I'm not sure why. Something screaming. <laughs> I always think they sound like they're saying burr, burr, <laughs> like they're cold. <laughs> so I remember, oh, a sci-fi laser beam. I had a tree frog like that that used to hang out in a birdhouse. I, I have a picture of one in a birdhouse too. They like those kind of small little spaces. Awesome. Yeah, so these ones, I like them. I think they're probably one of my favorite um, species of frogs just because they're so weird looking and so cool. Um, then we also have two other ones that look really, really similar. Um, so these two, the green frog and the American bullfrog, the way to tell the difference between these two is that the green frogs, they have these um, little ridges along their back. So I don't know, Mary, if you can point to that, the little ridges on their back. And bullfrogs do not have those. Their back just, just looks nice and smooth. Um, so that's the, the main way that you can tell the difference between these two. And they can be brown, they can be green, they can be like almost like a yellowish, tannish color. They, they vary a lot also. Um, so we can play maybe the green frog next. <laughs>
revving motor. <laughs> rubber bands, yep. I always think rubber bands. Typically people say banjo, like some like bunk, 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 bunk on a banjo. Yeah. Or one of those <laughs> like um you know like those box, like the the one like string box things, I can't remember what they're called. You know what I mean? They're like with like a hoedown type band, like that's sort of my <laughs> <laughs> so funny. Well, we're going, we will be getting to toads, don't you worry, it's really fine, Jimmy, like that. Uh, the last one that we'll play for you, the last frog, we're getting to toads, um, is the uh, American bullfrog. So this one has um, a word that's associated with it, but I don't, it didn't sound that, that on what that might be saying. A horse cow, a cow mooing. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the phrase that we say they're saying is juggerum, 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 but it doesn't always sound like that. <laughs> but that's what we can typically say. Trumpet, some of it sounds like a trumpet, absolutely. All right, old fashioned car horn. <laughs> Um, so then we also have three species of toads. Um, so just seven species of frogs and just three species of toads, and that's all we have in Rhode Island. So um, American toads are the most common ones, and all of our toads look kind of similar, um, but if you look really closely at the American toad versus the Fowler's toad, um, one thing that you can look for is on their bellies. The American toads usually have kind of black modeling or black spots. And on the Fowler's toads, they usually have a nice clean white or cream colored belly. And then they're, um, they're warty because toads are warty and usually can live in kind of drier conditions, whereas frogs usually like wetter conditions and are smooth and slimy. Um, so these toads, on the American toad, they usually have, they say, one to two warts per spot. <laughs> and then on the Fowler's toads, they have multiple warts per spot. So if it's like it's got a lot of warts in one of those darker colored spots, then it could be a Fowler's toad. And they usually live in more sandy soils and they're much less common. So if you see a toad, it's probably an American toad, but you can always look for those warts in their spots to see if you can tell the difference. And then the last one that we have is our Eastern Spadefoot toad. And these ones look really different from the other two. They've got these kind of cat-like pupils. They've got this kind of blunt snout and then their skin is less bumpy. It's a little bit bumpy, but mostly smooth. So they look a lot different than the other two species. And uh, Eastern spadefoot toads are a uh, species of greatest conservation need in Rhode Island, which means they need a little bit more um, help and protection. And Mary's gonna talk a little bit more about what we're doing with the spadefoot toads. But these ones, you can basically only find them by listening. They're pretty much impossible to find otherwise because they bury beneath the soil and they only come out to breed when there's really heavy rains and really perfect conditions. And so they're pretty much impossible to find, but we are doing some surveys and we found one new location where we have found spadefoot toads. So it's really exciting um, because they definitely have declined in the state um, since uh, um, from the past. So they're definitely at least in one other location that we know of. And we'll talk more about those in just a little bit, but we'll play some of these calls for you so you can hear them. singers must envy the American <laughs> toad if they're like screaming. sustaining note like <laughs> they can hold a note for a long time. <laughs> yeah I see someone screaming an alarm insanity yeah <laughs> so um these guys I hear I hear them a lot but um yeah they a lot of people think it's it's just a cricket an <laughs> AOL dialogue dialogue. Tone. um what? so not AOL's not outside your window <laughs> it's probably these guys um the really cool. I love hearing them. And when you hear a bunch together, it almost hurts your ears because it's it's so high pitched. Um, but really cool. 
Um, Fowler's toes. These guys sound really funny. So we'll they're running. I know. Yeah, if you thought this was insane, I always find this uh, <laughs> American toads like if they're far away, it's very soothing because it's like a subliminal like trill. But when they're on top of you, it's like oh my gosh, it's so loud. But wait for the Fowler's toad. So like, get brace yourselves. This is a little, <laughs> a little different. <laughs> Yeah, that's abrasive. <laughs> You're bust my speakers out. <laughs> yikes. Someone just says yikes. I always think when I hear Fowler's toads, it sounds like they're just going, wah, like they're crying. <laughs> they really mean business, yeah. He's afraid, very afraid. I heard a lot of Fowler's toads when I lived in Mississippi, yeah. <laughs> He's very afraid. I'd call the police. <laughs> I was told when I took herpetology pretty in college, funny, so. um, my professor was like, oh, it sounds like a, a hand mixer. You know, like the whirring of a hand mixer when you're beating cake batter. It's like oh. that high-pitched, annoying, like, whine. That's, that's what it reminded her of. So that's yeah, these guys, I, um, I worked on Fire Island for a little while, and I was monitoring um, reptiles and amphibians, and all they really had on uh, Fire Island are these fowler's toads and they were everywhere so we'd go out and do call surveys and listen for them and we'd just hear that that wah all the time. <laughs> Always we'll see. And then the last one is our eastern spade foot tone, also kind of a, a funny sounding one. Burping. <laughs> <laughs> definitely not the most elegant of calls no, but definitely not i always think they're saying meh, meh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're slightly upset about something <laughs> the sound my dog makes when he lays down that's pretty fun no blood flies or cries i don't know what left for this one all right so we have this cool video um that kind of, so Gabby has alluded to like, so you start to hear different calls throughout the season. Um, so this one, this this video is from uh, Wisconsin, I believe, a museum up in Wisconsin. So we do not have the boreal chorus frog uh, here in Rhode Island, but this kind of gives you a, an idea of like how everything kind of progresses. So our soundscape is gonna change uh, between now and August. Uh, so it's like super quick, it's like not even 15 seconds. That's like the whole spring and summer in 22 seconds. <laughs> it's beautiful, yeah, it's so beautiful. I love that. I watched that like 50 times when I found out. I was like, this is so cool. <laughs> really cool. Uh, okay, so we're going to move away from frogs. I love the frog section because it's like so much fun to hear the calls. So we will not hear any salamander calls tonight because they're pretty secretive and quiet. Um, but our next trivia question, how many salamander species do we have in Rhode Island? So I'm seeing in the chat six, four, twelve, three, nine, four. I'm thinking of a number between no, <laughs> six, seven. All right, so the answer is we have eight salamanders. So technically we have seven salamanders and one newt, uh, but we kind of lump the newt uh, in with the, with the salamander group. Uh, so these guys are, I love salamanders. They're one of my favorite animals in the whole wide world because they are just so cool. Um, they are so secretive and you can be walking through the forest and there's probably hundreds of them around you and you don't even know that they're there. And you're lucky if you ever find one because they're just so well hidden. Um, so we have, so our salamanders in the state are the two that are out, um, well, the one that's out right now or should be coming out very soon uh, in droves is the spotted salamander. This one's personally my favorite uh, in the state. So they're very chunky. I think it's about eight inches long, really chubby, stocky kind of salamander. And um, they're related to the marbled salamander. And you can see they kind of look like cousins with the big buggy eyes and the big smile. 
Uh, and these guys are known as mole salamanders, like a mole that burrows in the ground. So they spend their whole winter and pretty much most of the year in a little burrow, under a log, getting underneath some leaves, and they, they kind of just hang out underground for the most part, eating bugs and uh, slugs and snails and all sorts of things, spiders, um, and they only come out in bursts to breed. So uh, they have different strategies though. So the spotted salamander breeds in the spring, and this is our earliest salamander. They'll be marching around through the forest uh, in mid to late March, early April. If we get a nice warm night, like around 50 degrees, it doesn't sound that warm, but it's warm for these guys. Uh, nice rain falling, that's when you'll start to see them wandering around in the woods. And uh, they are trying to find vernal pools. So a vernal pool is just a seasonal pond in the middle of the forest, and uh, it fills in with melted snow, with groundwater, with rainwater runoff, and in the, in the middle of the summer, it's completely dry. It disappears. Um, so it, it fills up starting like early fall, the late winter, they'll start to accumulate some water and then they start to really top up. Um, this time of year, they're in perfect condition for wood frogs, for peepers, for spotted salamanders, uh, for spade foot toads. They're very, very important breeding habitats for amphibians. Uh, so what happens is the spotted salamander goes in, lays their eggs, there's like a mass breeding party uh, and they do like a, a dance, this courtship dance, so they all like swim around each other. It's really cool uh, to watch. And um, they lay their eggs and then they leave and that's it. And then they go spend the rest of their their year in the uplands, in the forest. Um, so vernal pools, the breeding habitat is super important for salamanders and, and other amphibians, but also the surrounding forest, they use that most of the year. Uh, so that's also critical for them. Marbled salamander is a little different. So when we think of amphibians, we usually think of the spring and early summer. Uh, marbled salamander comes out in the fall. So they're spending most of their time hiding. And then all of a sudden in late August, early September, they start to emerge. They go to the vernal pools that are dry. They mate, they lay their eggs, and the females will hang out and guard the eggs for a little bit. And then as the water starts to trickle in and fill up the pool, she'll leave and she'll leave the eggs to develop there. And those little baby salamanders will hatch uh, in the fall and into the winter. So Gabby actually just went out and was looking at a vernal pool frozen under, under the ice and you could see the little marbled salamanders, the larvae swimming around. So they, before they really have legs and they get the little gills sticking out um, and they'll be swimming around and spending their winter under the ice. They have metamorphose in the spring and they go out into the forest. They look cute, but they are cannibals. They like to eat the spotted salamander eggs. They'll eat other things, uh, other frog eggs in the vernal pools. They are ferocious little predators, even though they're not even an inch long. <laughs> so uh, vernal pools are so cool. It's like this crazy like microcosm in a puddle in the woods. Um, so next time you're out in the woods and you see a puddle, check it out and see if there's anything in there. Uh, yeah, those, I just wanted to mention, Mary, those um, two species of salamanders, they're big. So they're not small like you think when you see a salamander, they're teeny tiny, like typically we see the redbacks, which I'm sure Brian will mention. Um, but these marble salamanders and the spotted salamanders, they can get big, they can get like six inches long and pretty thick, they're pretty heavy bodied. So these ones are really, really cool and, and really impressive when you see them. Gabby and I actually found a marble salamander that was a board behind our office. And she's like, oh, I wonder if there's anything under that board. And she picked it up in like, it was like August, September. And she picked it up, she's like, there's a marble salamander. And he was just like, sitting underneath there like, oh, I was, I was sleeping. <laughs> so you never know where you're gonna find these things, they just pop up. Uh, so we have two smaller salamander species, the northern two-lined. If you look very carefully on this little guy's back, you can see these two kind of golden lines running down the back. They're very pretty uh, when you see them uh, up close. These guys are a little trickier to find. Uh, you can find them in like stream type habitats and mossy habitats. Obviously this guy's sitting on some moss. Um, a little more difficult to find them. Uh, I, I find it difficult. Gabby has good luck. I always, I, I could lift up 20 logs and come up with a bunch of pill bugs and Gabby will find a salamander. Um, yeah, the four-toed salamander, so like its name says, it has four toes, uh, but it also, the way that I remember four-toed is this little cream-colored belly with those cute little uh, Dalmatian spots on the belly. So they're kind of kind of just tan on the top, but those little spots are the key. Then we have uh, some, some rarer species, the northern spring salamander, not called spring because of the season, but because of where it lives. It likes seeps and springs in the forest. This is probably one of our rarer salamanders in the state. Um, there's, there's records of it uh, more in the northern half of the state, um, but I personally have never seen one of these in Rhode Island. I think I saw one in West Virginia on a, on a herpetology trip, but I've never found one of these guys. They're pretty secretive 
a little tricky to find. Uh, the northern dusky salamander, also a little tricky to find, a lot smaller. Uh, these guys are pretty chunky, the, the spring salamanders, but the, the dusky salamanders, kind of just like plain gray, got kind of a, a pointier uh, snout going on there, but um, just kind of just kind of lying low. Uh, and then we have the most common salamander here in Rhode Island, and probably the most common animal in the northeastern woods, the eastern redback salamander. So there's a statistic out there, some very smart person <laughs> came up with this formula where they figured that the number of eastern redback salamanders, if you weighed all of the eastern redback salamanders, put them in a giant bag, every single salamander out there in the northeastern forest, if you weighed them, they would weigh more, just that one species collectively would weigh more than all of the birds, mammals, and anything else <laughs> that's living there combined. There's so many of these redback salamanders out there um, and that's probably the most common one you're gonna, if you flip a log pretty much anywhere, you're gonna find these. Uh, and you can see he's got this kind of rusty red back, uh, can go a little bit orangey, it can sometimes look brown. And there is also a lead morph, uh, so a lead backed or gray backed salamander. Um, so it, it, but it doesn't look quite like the dusky, so he's got that pointed snout. They're kind of a, a broader, shorter snout. Um, so you, and sometimes you'll find the red ones and the gray ones sitting right next to each other. Uh, and then last but not least are newt, the red spotted newt. These guys are so cool because they lay their eggs in the water, they swim, obviously they live in the water, they've got these cool little tails and uh, very fun to watch them swimming around uh, in the shallows of a pond. Uh, but you also have this crazy looking little dragon thing right here and this is the juvenile phase of the newt. So they lay their eggs in the water, the eggs hatch out of the water, they metamorphose into this thing which is called an egg. EFPF. And the Fs uh, will march around in the forest. So you can see this is not an aquatic animal. He doesn't have a, a webbed tail. He's got kind of a scaly tail. They're very dry and papery feeling. They are fire engine red. So if you've ever flipped a log, you're like, what is that thing? They are bright, bright red, almost orange. And they spend years like this in the forest. They can spend five, six, seven years like this before they metamorphose back into their adult aquatic form. Uh, which I think is just so cool, the, the complexities of um, these, these little critters that are so secretive. Um, so if you're interested in learning more, if you, you know, we just threw a lot of facts at you, uh, Lindsay is going to throw in the chat uh, our frog fact sheet and our salamander fact sheet that has a lot more details about each species, uh, if you'd like to save those for later reading. All right, we're going to skip ahead, so I'll let Gabby take over. And I just wanted to mention, Mary mentioned that, um, yeah, I was just going to say, so that red um, F that Mary was talking about, when she was talking about, it's bright red. Um, the reason why is because they're actually poisonous. Pick them up, just be careful handling them. And the same thing with um, our toad species. So they actually have these special glands on their back. And so it uh, prevents predators from eating them because they do have those toxins um, on them. But just, again, it's not gonna hurt you if you pick them up, just don't eat them. <laughs> I don't know why you would, but just don't. Um, all right, so on to our next, Trivia question, what is the biggest threat to amphibians in Rhode Island? I see habitat loss, pollution, humans, another habitat loss, habitat, pollution. Awesome, you guys hit the nail right on the head. So absolutely, so the biggest one is habitat loss. And that's exactly what it sounds like, it just, they no longer can use a habitat, whether it's been built on, whether it's been polluted or something else has happened, it's no longer livable. Um, but then the other part of that is fragmentation. So it's kind of associated with habitat loss because they're losing part of their habitat. But fragmentation is basically when you have a nice big chunk of habitat and then you put a road and you put some houses and you put some businesses and the habitat shrinks and becomes these tiny little islands of habitat that aren't easy to get to. So in a nice whole big chunk of habitat, a salamander can move from it, it's the place where it's overwintering right into the vernal pool to lay its eggs and then right back again. Um, and it's nice and safe for them. But in a fragmented habitat, that salamander might have to cross a road in order to get to that nice uh, vernal pool to lay its eggs. And when that happens, they can get hit by cars. And Mary's gonna talk a little bit um, later about some of the surveys that we're doing to kind of see where those hot spots are. Um, so that's the biggest one is just habitat loss and fragmentation. 
And that's why we protect so much habitat um, at the Division of Fish and Wildlife to make sure we have these nice big chunks, not only for amphibians, but for all of wildlife, because it's important to have whole, intact, healthy habitat for all of our wildlife. The other one, someone mentioned it also, it's pollution. So like Mary said, amphibians have permeable skin, so they absorb water, they absorb oxygen through their skin, and if a water body gets polluted, they'll also absorb any of those toxins in through their skin. And because they're so sensitive, they're actually um, able to kind of indicate whether a habitat is healthy or not. Um, so they're considered indicator species. So if there are tons of frogs in an area, we know it's nice and healthy. If for some reason there were frogs there and now there are none, we know something's definitely wrong because they do are so sensitive. Um, and then the other big ones are, of course, climate change. So the, that fluctuating temperature definitely is hard for amphibians to adjust to because they're ectothermic. So their body temperature depends on the air or water temperature. So having really extreme heat um, or really extreme cold is going to really damage them and they won't be able to um, come back from that. In fact, in the summertime, it's so hot that most amphibians hide um, in the summertime. So having too hot and too extended a period of hot time can really hurt them. And then as sea levels rise, if they're going to flood some of our nice freshwater wetlands over along the coast, that's definitely going to hurt our amphibians because they can't tolerate salt water, they need fresh water. And then the last one um, is disease. So this is a really big one. There are a couple of diseases that are really hurting our amphibians, um, not only in Rhode Island, but across the US, across the world. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how you guys can help and a little bit more about those diseases. Um, in just a couple of minutes, but um, I also wanted to point out on the slide as Mary was talking about vernal pools and that really special habitat, that picture in the slide is a vernal pool. So they can look really different. They can look like just a flooded forest. You might walk by and be like, oh, there's a puddle in the woods, but really that's a really important puddle for frogs, for salamanders. Um, and like she said, they'll dry up, but in the springtime, they'll look just like this it's kind of mossy and shallow water. So if you see one of those as you're walking along the path, especially this time of year, um, and in the next kind of month or two months, take a peek in and see if you can find any eggs or any larvae or any tadpoles, because that's where they're going to be. And I'll hand it over to Mary to talk a little bit about our work at the division. Yeah. So I know one of my favorite clues when you're looking at vernal pools, when it's not full, when you look at these trees, they look like they're splayed. A little bit like they've got little like pedestals that's the tree reacting to the soil being very damp for part of the year and you can even see sometimes they'll have a moss line on them so you can see this tree looks like it's been dunked it's dunked its toes in moss so that's showing you where the high water mark might be on those trees over the years um, another thing i would add with you know with vernal pools and climate change is that um, when we think about you know okay so these these animals the you know wood frogs the peepers the spotted salamanders they're on the fast track right they're laying their eggs in march and april and by July, that pool is bone dry. Right? Unless you got a really ton of, like a ton of rain that year, it's gonna be bone dry. But if we have hotter summers and, and more intense heat, then that may shorten the period that we have water in those pools. So then all of a sudden you're already on a fast track trying to metamorphose really quickly. And then if you don't make it and the pool all of a sudden dries up quicker than, than these animals have adapted to, then that's gonna severely affect the reproductive success of these animals and the number of new frogs and salamanders that are going to be joining those populations. This is something really that's like, wow, climate change, like we think of like, oh, you know, the air and the water and whatever, it, it's going to affect everything, um, even things that are in the forest. Uh, so protecting those core areas of forest, making sure that we're really, um, you know, protecting habitat, that's going to provide refuge for these animals in the future um, if, we're, if we're having, you know, warming temperatures. Okay, so some things that we're doing to help at the Division of Fish and Wildlife, obviously habitat protection, we've talked about this a lot, so I'm not going to belabor it. Um, and Gabby had mentioned road mortality surveys. So there's a graduate student at URI uh, who's going out. It's, it's kind of a sad project. <laughs> you know, I, feel, I feel bad for Noah because he's, you know, he's going out at night on these nights where we're talking about, oh, it's raining. That means the salamanders are really going to be moving. And he goes out on those nights or the, the day after and looks at wooded areas, looks at the roads, and he searches for little critters that have been squished by cars, unfortunately. So he's trying to see, wow, there's a lot in this particular area, or, oh, there's not too many over here, but, you know, kind of targeting these areas and seeing, like, well, there must be a heavy population of amphibians, and there's going to be some good habitat on either side of this road. 
So identifying these hot spots where we're seeing a lot of road mortality, um, you know, for, for amphibians, but also we, uh, turtles and snakes are, are um, subject to this as well in, in times of peak, not necessarily right now in March and April, but in May and June, when those animals are really moving around, uh, they're susceptible to it as well. Uh, so by, by this, you know, by identifying these hot spots in these key areas, uh, it's, hope, it's hopeful that we can kind of bring this up and say, well, well, maybe we should put up some signage or maybe there could be, um, there's some really cool ways that uh, people have in other areas have uh, created little tunnels underneath the roads and they funnel the animals to use these little passageways um, so that they, they're at least, not all of them may, may make it through the tunnel, but it could help significantly reduce the number that are getting squished by cars. Um, so that is anything that we can do to help on that end uh, is, is great. Uh, also, you know, we do some annual monitoring. So we do have a staff herpetologist, Scott Buchanan. Uh, so he goes around and he does um, uh, the spade foot toad surveys. Gabby and I went out with him uh, in August. Was that August or September? Uh, <laughs> COVID has made my, <laughs> my months all run together. Uh, but the, the late summer it was still pretty warm out. Um, we went out at night with him and uh, you take a headlamp and you walk around and you level your headlamp and you look through the forest and what you're looking for are the eyes of the spade foot because Gabby said those big giant cat eyes, they reflect the light of the headlamp. Uh, so that's a good way to detect them in the forest. And it's crazy, you think like, oh yeah, if I see a frog, like I'll definitely see it. There are so many eyes watching you in the woods at night. We saw so many green eyes from spiders uh, and, and other critters. We saw a weasel while we were out there, a little weasel running up and down a stone wall. Um, and this is a pretty effective way of, of surveying for them. And as Gabby said, you know, the, the call surveys are really important, uh, but they only call when conditions are absolutely perfect. But Scott was able to detect some with eye shine surveys when they were not calling uh, because it was at the end of the summer, so they're breeding in the spring, right? So they're coming out at the end of the summer, hopping around, looking for some food. Uh, he saw some uh, kind of corkscrewing down into the ground, so it was burrowing itself back down into the soil. Uh, they were able to find some activity, uh, and that's how they were able to locate a brand new site uh, that was unknown uh, prior. Uh, we kind of had three sites that we knew that spade foots were in, and now uh, Scott has been able to find another site, and he's hoping there's other promising looking areas. So he's going to continue those uh, those surveys because they might be in places that we don't know. They're just so secretive. So um, it's it's estimated that the, the populations are much lower um, than we would like in the state. Uh, so he's hoping by through those surveys that'll kind of maybe say, okay, well, let's protect that habitat or um, uh, do some restoration of habitat, which we'll talk about in just a second. Um, and of course, education, right? Where this right here is, is part of how we're helping. The more people who know about these issues, who know about um, the threats that these animals face, you know, you guys are all super important in this too. Tell your friends and family, tell your neighbor. Uh, so it just, it's, it's always great to spread this information because Gabby and I are, are just two people, um, you know, running around the state talking to anybody who'll listen. But um, the more that we can spread about these animals and, and um, share our joy and excitement about them too, uh, the better. There's a question in the chat about if there's any um, like big night um, coordinated efforts. Yeah, that's a great question. So in other states, I know Massachusetts and Connecticut both do this um, where they have volunteers go out and they know, oh, it's a big night. That means the conditions are great. The rain is falling. That means that animals are going to be moving and they have volunteers go out with buckets and they assist animals across the road. Um, right now, we don't do anything like that. Um, that's where that, that study could come in handy uh, that NOAA is doing at, at URI uh, to kind of identify those places where maybe the animals need help and then we can maybe coordinate those efforts towards um, those spots instead of sending people out like, ah, I don't know where we could go on the road because uh, that's obviously like a safety concern sending out volunteers at night on the road. Um, so if we can identify those places where uh, the animals most need it, then maybe we can uh, coordinate future events. Uh, personally, I'm dying to do that. Like, sign me up, give me a bucket. <laughs> I will go out in the rain and save all the salamanders I can. Uh, there's a great book, if, uh, if there are any families on here, there's an awesome book by a Massachusetts author called Big Night for Salamanders. And it follows a family um, who uh, does just that. They, they have salamanders across the road from them and they and their son go out and, and do this. Um, and so it's based on her, her own experience, the author's own experience with her son. It's a very sweet book. If you do want to go out and help salamanders cross roads, sometimes I do, um, just make sure, like Mary said, it, be safe. So wear a headlamp, wear a fluorescent orange, um, and you can help them across. Make sure your, your hands are wet, just like you were saying before. But if you do know that you have some that cross road by you and you do want to help on your own, you can, you can do that. <laughs> just be safe. There's so. also a question about um, frog watch. 
Oh, Frog Watch. Yes, so Frog Watch is through uh, is coordinated through the Roger Williams Park Zoo. Um, so that's uh, they're actually doing trainings this month. So this is a great opportunity uh, for you to get involved. So it's not through DEM, but we are partners with the zoo, so we definitely support their efforts. Um, so basically, you get trained, and, and Gabby and I just did the frog calls. You got half your training right there. Uh, but they'll review the calls, and they'll review. There's like a quick little protocol. Um, so say you just you can go to any site you want. You can sit. I did it one year. I sat on my front porch and, and listened for the frogs. Um, and you just type in any time you want, anytime you have 10 minutes or whatever, you listen uh, for the frogs, you type in a couple of little things on an online form, and that all goes um, into a database. And this is a, a national uh, citizen science effort. That's a really cool way to get involved. Uh, so the zoo is running those uh, those trainings uh, this month if you're interested, definitely check it out. Um, I just put a link in the chat just in case anyone. Thanks. <laughs> So I see a, a, uh, this one just came into me. Um, I didn't go to the big group, but can you catch salmonella from touching a salamander? That's a great question. So uh, salmonella is really more of a, I feel like a reptile risk, um, but with any any wildlife, if you're gonna handle you know, any reptile or amphibian, I would definitely wash your hands after after handling them. If you're gonna eat something, or don't touch your face after touching them, uh, because as Gabby said, some, some uh, amphibians, when they're threatened, they release uh, toxic mucus uh, it's a defense mechanism that tastes really bad so if a predator is trying to get them they, they, they go Ugh, and they spit it out um but it can be irritating to your eyes uh, so make sure that you wash your hands after touching them but we've handled many a salamander and we're we're perfectly fine and then there's a question about if homeowners can create their own vernal pools ah okay so that's a great question so this actually ties perfectly into um this operation spade foot um so right now i there's really it's so basically, it's very difficult to create a vernal pool. So this, this project was done um, in partnership uh, between us, URI, the zoo, and the Rhode Island Natural History Survey. And um, the, uh, one of the professors at URI brought in a specialist. He's like a nationally renowned specialist on creating vernal pools uh, because it's, believe it or not, it's more than just like the depression in the forest. It's more than just digging a little depression. It is um, because the, these pools have formed over millennia, right? So they're, the soil conditions, the way that the water percolates up through them, the vegetation that surrounds them, the slope and like the scale of the, of the vernal pool, these all matter. So he's, he's created this like formula on how to create a vernal pool and, and all of these characteristics. Um, so this is a really cool project that involved a bunch of volunteers. So back before COVID when we could all stand together in a photo, uh, without masks, everybody uh, in this big team effort, they brought in a backhoe, they dug out um, this, this perfectly sloped vernal pool, put down a tarp, they planted native vegetation. Uh, and this is a site in Richmond uh, that was uh, seemingly suitable for spadefoot toads in particular, but that's not to say that other critters might not use it as well. Um, but they were specifically targeting the spadefoot toad. Um, and this was fairly successful. So we actually had um, the, one of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife the visitor centers, they found a bunch of spadefoot tadpoles literally in a puddle in the parking lot and they're going this puddle's going to dry up this is not a vernal pool they scooped them all up and they were in a tank in scott's office at uh, at our great swamp headquarters and uh, some of them went to the zoo uh, lou parati over at the zoo uh, is an amazing our conservation uh director and he's a, like a lifelong herpetologist uh, so he took some of them and they they raised them successfully to toadlets um which are just baby toads uh, small the metamorphs and uh, they released some of them on site and get, put some back and so they, they kind of tried to found this population a little bit um, but that was like a really it was just like sheer dumb luck that it was like oh my gosh they're the spade foot toad babies uh, let's scoop them up and that was it was amazing that they were able to save them um, from an untimely fate uh, so this uh, pool I think they'll be doing some monitoring there uh, over the years to see uh, if we attract spadefoots, any other amphibians. Um, so in short, creating a vernal pool in your backyard while noble is very difficult. Um, so it's, it, the conditions have to be just right. Um, that's not to say that there's other things that you can do in your yard, like um, putting out, I've seen people put out like little flower pots, uh, kind of sideways to make toad houses. Uh, so creating some little shelters. Uh, for amphibians, uh, putting out, uh, letting, you know, leaving rotting logs in places where you can, uh, rocks, these are all creating uh, small habitats uh, for uh, amphibians because remember, they don't just use the vernal pool, they, they use the upland as well. So if you have other habitat, they will definitely utilize it if you create it um, and, and make it welcoming for them. So we are, I just want to check the time. So we're at 7.34. I just want to turn this over to Gabby really quick to talk about how ways that you can get involved. And we understand if folks have to 
pop off, but we're more than happy to stick around and, and answer more questions as we go. All right, so I know those other questions were relating to how you can help with amphibians or help amphibians. So a few things that you can do, Mary mentioned some like make, creating some habitat in your yard. Um, so try not to use chemicals, that's a big one. So we know that uh, frogs and toads, they feed on insects. So if we're, we're hurting insects and could in, unintentionally be hurting frogs and toads when they consume them, they might get some of those toxins in their bodies, which wouldn't be good. Um, also, if you're spraying your yard and you have a wetland nearby, then that could wash down into the wetland. And again, those amphibians could absorb it through their skin. Um, and this is a really important one. So I talked a, a little bit about some of the diseases that amphibians um, can contract. And one of them is chytrid fungus and the other is ranavirus. And these two have basically like wiped out huge numbers of amphibians around the world. And there's a really simple way that we can um, help prevent this, these diseases from spreading. And that's just by sanitizing your equipment that you use in wetlands. Um, so Lindsay can post in the chat the link to our how to sanitize equipment so you can read more details on it. But basically, it's really easy to do if you go into a wetland, um, either like with muck boots on, or if you're going kayaking, after you leave, you're gonna wanna make sure that you spray down all of your equipment with a 3% bleach solution and kind of scrub off any dirt that's there. Let it sit for just like five minutes. You can rinse it off or let it dry in the sun. And then that just gets rid of all of those um, diseases that could be carried on your equipment. So really simple, really quick to do, and it makes a really big difference. So if you're going from you know kayaking in one wetland and you can walk to the next one, you don't have to clean it in between. But if you're going really long distances farther than walking, you wanna make sure that you do that every time. The other thing that you can do, we kind of talked about it already, so I won't go too in depth, but just keep your eye out on rainy nights, especially warm rainy nights, because Mary mentioned that's when they're all moving. If you want to go out and help, you can. Just make sure you're being safe about it. And then the last thing, which is awesome, really fun, we can become a herb observer. So you don't have to sign up for anything for this. You don't even have to like let us know that you're going to do it. All you have to do is download the herb observer app which is um, survey one, two, three, and we have links to that also, which Lindsay can put into the chat. Um, and when you do that, then you can take a picture of any amphibian or reptile that you see anywhere in Rhode Island, any time of year. And that goes straight to our state herpetologist, so nobody else will know about it except for him. And then he can kind of tell where amphibians are in the state. And it kind of gives him a sense of, of what's going on. And it's really important that we have everyone help because some of these amphibians are really hard to find and these reptiles are really hard to find but the, the regular person might walk by and be like hey that's a cool thing I don't know what it is and they take a picture of it and it's actually something really rare and we didn't even know that it existed in that part of the state. Um, we have a quick video on it I don't know if we have time to share it. if you want to stick around you can stick around and watch this video otherwise feel free to jump off if you need to. Sorry, oh, I'm muted. So the, excuse the editing quality of this video. This was the first one we made in quarantine. Uh, we started a wave of videos. It was wild um, to try to connect with people and, and get stuff out there. So this is Scott, our, our staff herpetologist. We had a lot of fun making this video just to get people on board with herp observer. So we hope you get a kick out of it. nature. Oh look, a frog. I wonder if anybody cares about that. Hi, I'm Scott Buchanan, herpetologist with the Rhode Island Division of Fish and Wildlife, and I'm here to tell you about an easy-to-use smartphone app called Herp Observer. It allows you to submit observations of any amphibian and reptile you find in the state and instantly submit them to our secure database. We welcome all observations of species common and rare. And don't worry if you don't know every species in Rhode Island, we're gonna review those observations, make sure you got it right. Click the link for directions on how to download and use Herp Observer. What's a herp? Herps are 
reptiles, amphibians like frogs and toads and salamanders and snakes and turtles. There we go. All right, so that, <laughs> we had a lot of fun. If anybody's wondering how we got the drone shot, uh, that is Scott's drone uh, that, and, and also the Habitat Program's drone that we have uh, for monitoring for diamondback terrapins. Somebody managed, uh, mentioned diamondback terrapins in the chat. So Scott actually flies it over salt ponds high up because the terrapins are really, really hard to see when you're in the water, like on a kayak, and he can actually float over um, and you can see the terrapins in the water swimming. And we also use it for habitat, um, for habitat observations as well. Uh, but we were like, can we use the drone <laughs> for the fun video? So uh, we had a lot of fun. Uh, so that is pretty much it for tonight. Uh, we thank you all so, so much for joining us and we hope you learned a lot about amphibians. We are here if you would like to continue to ask questions. Um, and if you have to hop off, that's, that's great too. Uh, we hope everybody has a great night and uh, happy frog watching <laughs> and salamander watching. And also Lindsay posted in the chat the link to our outreach page so you can see all of our upcoming events. Um, and thank you Nomi for hosting this program for the yes. Living Living Library. Thank you so much. It was great as usual. Thanks have a so good night everyone. I, I have to go because we're closing up here but oh, that's okay. Care. And good night. Thank have you. I'm seeing, oh, someone asked in the chat, um, share a link to this video with some friends who couldn't watch tonight. Absolutely. So um, later on, I will actually send a, uh, a sheet to everybody um, who registered. We're going to send all of those links that we put in the chat um, because we understand like, oh, you got to click and everything. So, so you'll have those links already. And we're going to be putting this um, on our YouTube page. So I can hold off um, on sending those links to you until I can upload this onto YouTube. I can try to get it up tomorrow. Um, takes a little while because it's about a, over an hour, but um, I can include that as well in the link page. So we're here if anybody wants to ask questions. If not, have a great night. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to.